Welcome in to a Monday edition of the Husker 24-7 podcast and a commitment reaction edition of the Husker 24-7 podcast, though it is not admittedly the most timely as Brian and I did not stay up uh, to do this podcast right after Preston Talmua committed to Nebraska wee hours of the morning. It wasn't that late local time in Hawaii, but for those of us in, in Nebraska, Brian, I think this is even later than the Drake Martinez commitment, which was the only other one that I think fell after midnight uh, that I've ever covered. I forgot about the Drake Martinez one. So um, yeah, this, this was uh it was beyond my bedtime, but I, I, I did stay up. People on the board can attest to it. I was posting a couple things about it and uh, our, our boys at 24 seven sports were all over this one. Yeah. They, uh, that's you're you're only as good as the network that you belong to. That's how I feel about recruiting. And we have a really good network. I mean, the, for, for Blair Angula to, to sort of be all over this one. And, and he was, you know, going back into even, late June, Brian, I don't, I don't know if you remember um, the, the kind of story he put out with Nebraska as one of the top four teams there after those visits. And then I think I had reached out to him and he basically was like, Hey, I know it looks like it could be Oregon, but I would not rule out Nebraska at all. And then a couple of days later, it goes from not ruling out Nebraska to, Hey, wait a minute, maybe they are the favorites here after all. And so uh, 24 seven sports. I mean, I, obviously we belong to, to the network. And so we're going to talk up our guys, but seriously, the amount of help that we get from Steve Wiltfong and Blair Angulo and Andrew Ivins and Brandon Huffman and Greg Biggins and Alan true and Gabe Brooks. And, you know, I'm forgetting multiple people, local guys like Sean Bach. I mean, it is, it is makes my job so much easier. And especially when, you know, Nebraska's got 24 commitments on July 17th. Like, so, you know, it's a, it's a whole new world. And I'm very thankful that the 24 seven sports network is all over all of this. Yeah. It's worth bringing up, uh, especially in this case, because uh, Preston Talamua himself um, in the interview with 24 seven sports, he, he brought up Blair. He was with Blair like on June 30th or July 1st, I guess was the date. And at that point, um, people still sort of, I think, from the outside looking in thought Oregon. And if you listen to uh, Talamua talk about his thoughts, you know, as a recruit and even as a kid growing up, Oregon was always sort of the school he dreamed about, I think, Mm -hmm. and planned to go to. And um, for Nebraska to sort of in the last month from their June 19th visit date, I believe it was when he came to Lincoln Mm -hmm. um, and over the weeks ahead to really change that by like July 1st or 2nd, it began to shift and Blair was sort of on the front door of that information. It seemed like, um, and, and put in a crystal ball. And I think you kind of knew at that point, eh, Nebraska is a favorite and it held up and, um, you got to give Donovan Riola a ton of credit on this one. He's a Hawaii guy connecting to a fellow Hawaiian. And, um, I think just the way he, coaches and sort of his no-nonsense um, way of doing things is going to appeal to certain guys, and this was one such recruit. Yeah, I I mean, I think it it should be maybe more obvious than it is how big the rail and name is out on the islands, but you're, you know, we, we talk, we know Dominic, certainly well before Dylan Rayola was ever a thing. Dominic Rayola was a big deal in the state of Nebraska because of his play as a center for several years with this team. His name is up on the stadium. I mean, he's one of the all-time greats. We were going through offensive line, Mount Rushmore, and he very well could be included, you know, as, as people assemble those lists. And so um, the Rayola name is is big here in Nebraska, but it's huge out in Hawaii. And then certainly his brother was – was a great player for Wisconsin before, you know, he was with the bears and and everything else. And before he was at Nebraska. And so I I think part of it, sometimes it, it, it is kind of simplistic when you talk about some of these things with a position coach, we're talking about Donovan Rayola, who's a center at Wisconsin and Dominic Rayola is center at Nebraska. And these guys play interior offensive line and Preston uh, Talamua could end up as an interior offensive, more than likely ends up as an interior offensive lineman from Hawaii. Like, 
it sometimes it's just as simple as somebody knows your journey. They've been in on a similar one. Like you, you kind of want to learn from that person. Like, so I, I think that that had a, a big impact on the whole thing. Uh, you know, he name checked two Nebraska guys and Carter Nelson and Daniel Kalen in the commitment story as uh, noting that Nebraska had walked away with those victories in recruiting, which I don't think is insignificant that a kid in Ainsworth, Nebraska, and another kid at Bell West are getting mentioned by somebody on the islands as, uh, you know, notable to them that they, they ended up in this class. So they obviously had to have done some work in the DMs and the, you know, wee hours of the morning to, to make that time change peer recruiting work. But yeah, I, I just, this whole thing is, is just kind of fascinating to me. I detailed a little bit of Nebraska's history in Wyoming, uh, in a, a Wyoming, in Hawaii, Wyoming, in it's Hawaii. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jackson Hole is, is pretty beautiful, and I guess so <laughs> is, is, is Hawaii. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's pretty much where it starts and stops. But um, so I, I detailed some of this in, in a story that went up on Monday, but you know, Nebraska's every staff I've ever covered, Brian, I don't know what it was like under Callahan and Solich, but every staff I've ever covered had treated Hawaii as just sort of like thing that they've wanted to be involved with, whether it was Ron Brown taking recruiting trips for Keani Bushlew in 2012 and some other guys, whether it was, uh, you know, Mike Cavanaugh and Mark Banker going yeah. there with and, and <laughs> Tavita Thompson being heavily involved in all of it, whether it was, you know, you remember Tony Tuioti and and Scott Frost talking about the recruiting visit that he took to Hawaii. And, uh, you know, he's going around with Tuioti and everybody knows who Tuioti is. And he's pointing out where these great restaurants are and great cliff diving places and all of that. Like the, every coach has had an infatuation with Hawaii. So now you have a guy actually from Hawaii who played in the Big Ten that plays offensive line. Yeah, I would think Donovan Rayola is going to have an opportunity to help Nebraska recruit there. And with Ben Scott out of the transfer portal and now Preston Tawamua, that's a heck of a start uh, if they're going to make some inroads with some offensive linemen for the future out of that state. Yeah, and prior to those guys, um, it's interesting if you look at the letter winners Nebraska's had from that state. There's only like five or six of them. I named them in the preview story. Mm -hmm. um, now. A couple of them are Ryola yeah. and uh, Vinodi. Um, Which, co correct my memory if 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 I'm wrong on this, because I was younger and sometimes like what you think you remember is not always the most accurate. Vinodi was a hell of a lineman all on his own, right? Like, I mean, he was like all conference type player, or nearly. He was really good. Was he, was he an all American? I uh, can't remember offhand and everybody can cheat and look this up and they'll be yeah. like, Oh yeah, he was dummy, you know, as they, but I can't remember that, but he was really good. He was like all conference type player and he played in the NFL for a few years and uh, was just a monster of a man. And so, yeah, you would take guys like him every day of the week on a college roster and obviously with Ryla. So I think that that still matters. Those names, um, there's a lot of pride I've noticed whenever I've interviewed recruits from Hawaii about those guys. They don't have to be guys who just were like stars five or 10 mm -hmm. years ago. There is like legacies of guys from two to three decades back who made it to the big stage that get talked about and are revered in those parts. And the kids really respect that. And so that does matter that Nebraska has a history there. But so there's that piece of it. And then the other side of it is really there has been no history, despite the attempts you mentioned by various coaches, aside from they did get Wyndon Hooli, um, who I didn't say his last name correctly, but Oh Hooli. Oh Hooli in um what was it the twenty one class, I guess. What did that been? Uh twenty two class. He committed on January second okay. of twenty twenty one. Wait, yeah. Twenty one class. You're right. Twenty one class. He committed on January 2nd of 2021, same day that JoJo Doman announced he was coming back for the 21 season. So you're right. It's a class of 21. So they signed him. He was only here a year, but they did sign him. And prior to him, it had been until 1999 that Nebraska signed a player from the state. So there is that like, yes, there's some some major success stories from the state, but there's also a very limited data mm -hmm. of guys accumulated that are connected to Husker football from there. And so, yeah, if you can get inroads there, there are really good players who uh, who have obviously succeeded and, and made it to the NFL from there. And um, I think 
it's a it's a part of the world where when one guy has success at a certain place that 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 carry that has carryover and it, it does it means something to the people who go to that school and coach that guy it's like yeah this is a place to consider for the next guy who's really good so this could be a big deal if they could get a player from hawaii to really take off yeah no you you nailed it i mean one of the things that we've seen at wisconsin notre dame places like texas tech and arizona once you kind of established that you've gotten a guy or two in and then they start to play all of a sudden you start to see that that slow you know you know trickle of different players it, it's not like it's an every year thing yeah but wisconsin's had several notable linebackers from hawaii what have they picked up in recent years more linebackers from hawaii manti teo and other guys made it fashionable to go from hawaii to notre dame uh so obviously the coastal schools are still going to be uh prime competition for every one of these kids they're still going to look at washington and oregon and the you know usc and and cal and and UCLA, but I think if Nebraska is able with Ben Scott and and Preston, you know, Talamua, I, I think they're going to have an opportunity to really sort of sell that back to to other guys on the islands. And they have. There's another. I'm not even going to attempt this name. His first name is Houston. There's a there's a 2025 offensive lineman from St. Louis High School, the big high school in Honolulu. Yep. Uh, that has an offer from Donovan Rayola already. And he retweeted last night when Preston committed. He put up the corn emoji and a GBR. So they're paying attention. Don't mm. be at all shocked if that kid's at a game at some point this year uh, or if he's visiting next year once Preston's on campus. Like, that's how these things work. And I, it's it's important. Like, you, you getting them here is one thing. Getting them on the field then becomes the second thing. And if that yeah. starts to go the direction that Nebraska wants – it's going to make it easier for Nebraska to go back into Hawaii. Uh, any other thoughts that you have here on this one? Well, one last thought on Hawaii. It is a tricky state to recruit. Like I know it sounds like from the, the outside, like, well, that's awesome. Get a trip to, you know, spend some time in Hawaii and eat some of the restaurants there and all that stuff. And if you get the kid good or, or not, you still went to Hawaii, but I know from talking to coaches, it's not an easy trip to make because you're sort of in and out. It's, all, you know, it's just a lot of flight hours and limited time there. And then you have to weigh like, um, is this worth our time, you know, like to, to, to spend these hours on that trip? So that's where you have to get some inroads. Um, otherwise, it is sort of an inefficient place to recruit if you don't have the connection. So that's where this could really help going forward. But, you know, I, I like the fact that they beat out, um, you know, a couple uh, pack 12 type schools, you know, in, in Arizona um, and Oregon, I guess Arizona was ended up in his final three he said we kind of thought Auburn might be there, but oh, yeah. um, he said Arizona and Oregon were the ones that he really considered along with Nebraska. Um, but just a, it's a fourth quarter win in the respect. And this is what I wrote today uh, for Donna, the Riola for Matt rule. And the fact that a month ago before this announcement was to happen, it looked like it was going to go one way. And then they flipped it this way. They also did a similar thing, I believe. I don't know all the inside info on it, but Ja'Cory Barney, I thought, was a guy who Nebraska kind of turned in the last, um, you know, hours on the clock on that one, so to speak, before the announcement. Now, things can always change before here in signing day. But that that's, that's uh, showing that you can win some recruiting battles when you have to play from behind, which I think they did on this one. There might be another one of those fourth quarter type recruitments out there and pretty close to home and in, in Grant Bricks. I mean, another mm -hmm. one you could throw out would be Carter Nelson. Uh, I think they closed that one out late when it looked like it could go somewhere else. So Grant Bricks could be in that category. And that kind of leads us to this, Brian. What, uh, you know, of, of what's left out there, Grant Bricks probably has to be the biggest target remaining. A top 247 offensive lineman would Nebraska is recruiting him as a tackle. He, and I've looked this up and people don't seem to believe me on this from where he lives in Iowa. He is less than 90 minutes from Memorial stadium. Wow. This is a proximity battle that Nebraska is way out in front on Kansas state and Oklahoma and any of the Iowa schools or Notre Dame or anybody else that's interested in Grant bricks, his home school is Nebraska. Matt Rule went up to watch him wrestle. Like mm. the seeds have been sown. They love this kid and they've made it apparent to him. He plays everything really, really close to the best, which is 
is fun to me uh, to yeah. a degree. You know, I, I like just like that Caden Massey recruitment a few weeks ago. I like when no one really knows what's going on uh, until the very big finish. And so Grant Bricks is, is to me the biggest biggest target left. And I don't know that there's another close one just because we're talking about a tackle position that, you know, even right now, if your starters remains relatively unsettled. Yeah, he's the biggest fish out there, I think, easily. I like what they've done now on the O-line with the, the latest addition, but I'm a big fan of Jake Peters, um, yeah. just sort of from surface view. And I know that's based off just like huddle highlights and talking to him. And there's a lot more that I, I would need to learn about. Well, you were him, there that day. Yes. I, 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 I did see him with my own eyes. I'm yeah. not going to act like I'm a scout for the uh, Los Angeles Rams or something, though. Um, <laughs> why, why the Rams? <laughs> I don't know. I just I pulled it out of, out of the air. I think they could use some scouts right now. I think. Well, their they're... scouts don't have a lot of work with all those picks they keep trading. Yeah. Well, that's true. Um, but it, whatever team would take me, I, I would I would uh, be a part of it. Um, but I would be probably a pretty average to subpar scout, is what I'm getting at, and. The point is, though, Jake Peters, uh, yes, he impressed us um, when we saw him with our eyes, but also, you know, just the way he kind of handles himself. And what guys, other people who have coached him and worked out or trained him have said, lead me to believe that could be a really impressive get. So I think if you look at the last two classes on the O-line, this one and last cycle, um, it all looks good on paper. Nebraska fans have heard and seen that before. And now it's like that one word we always talk about in the off season develop. Can you do it? Can you actually, um, you know, and this year, even with the veteran guys they have, can they show that type of progress on Donovan Ryola where it, it, it shows recruits like, Hey, look what Donovan Ryola is doing with Matt rules um, offense with Marcus Satterfield's offense. And uh, it's a different story than it was in year one with another regime. So that that's something you got to prove now to, I think, keep this momentum going. Absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to stick with recruiting. We're going to jump into some superlatives that I handed out on Sunday before the Preston Talmua commitment, and we're going to see how Brian Christopherson feels about some of these uh, some of these categories, some of the names I selected, and uh, we'll dive into the, the reasoning behind a few of these, not all of them. And you can, of course, catch all of that content at Husker twenty four seven. But we'll be right back. All right, I promised we were going to stick with recruiting, and that we will. Brian, on Sunday, I dropped a story uh, for superlatives. And, you know, normally when I do this in July, there's a class of, like, 12. And so, you know, you have – you kind of condense the categories down because uh, you don't want to give everybody into a category, and quite frankly, not everyone fits into a category. And then you have to make up a category to get everyone fit. And then you feel bad about the ones you don't include. I don't have to do that. They have 24 recruits. I think I had 10 different categories for, for recruits and then one for an assistant coach. Uh, and again, we won't dive into all of it. You can get the full story at Husker 24-7. But I want to go through some of these. And Brian, if there's if there's one you want to dive into, feel free to, to, to just say it right off the top. But I, I am curious. The toughest thing that I had here, Brian, was to try to pick out who the best player is in Nebraska's hmm. class. Now, this happened again before the Preston Talmua commitment. And obviously, Carter Nelson is the highest rated guy. Hmm. And I knew I was going to use him for another category. I don't feel like he's the best player in the class. As I was looking through it, and just going off of my own film and who I'm already suspecting is going to be high in my super six. And maybe I'm just riding the high of that post commitment interview, but I, I went with Carlin Jones here. I, <laughs> I think this is a big recruiting win. Will sent me a message over the weekend that he had talked with, with uh, you know, people related to, to Jones and the Nebraska visit was like one of those, yeah, let's go see it. It wasn't like a, I need to see it so I know it because I'm going to go there. It was, and eh, we'll see what they have. And that turned into, that's where we want to go. And I think Nebraska got a big win here with a kid that I think is going to be an important defensive lineman for him in the future. Yeah, I, under, I understand why you would put him at the top. And um, I know our uh, young Will was down there watching him even work out the other day and um was sending some clips along he's really impressive just how he moves for his size and everything and he does have 
I know words are words, but there is a certain swagger that came off in that interview of like, I'll say what I want to say and, you know, not worry too much about that. And I, I, I kind of like that because there's a confidence there, even in an interview setting that sometimes translates to other areas. And so that's impressive. So um, I think as you were posing the question about who's the best, it's tricky. It, and that, that's not that's not a bad thing. I mean, it, it, it can be really good if we get to that point where there's like eight to 10 guys where it's like, eh, but what about him over here? Gibson piles, a guy that I think the more you hear about his accolades and stuff, he posts at camps and just the actual data that he puts out to go with his highlights. I didn't even mention him when I was talking to the line last segment. Nope. I mean, he, uh, Gibson pile, I think I'd put in my top, uh three or so right now i that so uh and carlin jones would probably be in there too yeah well it's funny you mentioned gibson pile because as i was doing this exercise one of the one of the accolades or you know labels best nfl prospect and that's where i went because it's it's hard to argue with what we're hearing about as you said the testing numbers that he's putting up this is a guy with big upside i think is an interior offensive lineman i like his attitude uh, I like how he approaches stuff. I think he's a guy that's going to show up and work really hard from, from day one. And I think he's a good cultural fit on top of all of it. He might just be a damn good player that kind of got missed, you know, in the initial run of rankings. And he got bumped up here recently after just going out and showing out at a camp in Florida and winning the best offensive lineman award, getting invited to the all American bowl, uh, 24 seven bumped him up to an 88. If he goes down to San Antonio and he has a big year for in, in Houston uh, for his high school season, he'd be talking about a guy that's probably pushing to get uh, four star status, maybe even a, a top two four seven player. Uh, so Gibson Pyle is is a guy who's really jumped up. I think the the class rankings for me uh, if when I was kind of putting this whole thing together, and I got to be honest, when he first committed, I liked the film, I liked him. I didn't think a lot of it. It just felt like a guy that they they went down there and they got a guy who's just a great cultural fit. I know you've interviewed him. This is a guy who just loves everything about Nebraska. We knew he was going to commit before that March 22nd visit or that the end of March visit that he took just because he already loved Nebraska. And then he was coming out here to, to kind of see everything. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess I hadn't really thought about it that much. And then I started reading some of those reports and looking into it more and, so that's that's kind of the route that I took there. Let me let me throw one of these at you. If I was going to ask you right now, who's your sleeper? Who's a guy that you think people are maybe maybe not thinking about enough in this class? And then uh, we'll we'll talk about what my answer was after you give yours. I'm looking through the list. Yeah, I was not prepped on this, so that's that's why. Which is good. I'm not negative about that. Um, Rex Guthrie is my sleeper. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the reason is I can tell the staff sometimes there, there's certain signals like when, when they jump on a guy who not everybody else is on, but you can just tell there's like, man, that they're excited about him behind the scenes. And I feel like he's one of those players. Um, so I, I think he's going to surprise some people. I just think there's a confidence in what he can do. And if you actually go like look at what he's put out there, on tape and sort of his athleticism, I think he's going to fit really well here. So I, I think he's a, especially for that sleeper category, he's a name that comes to mind really quick. Yeah. I that was definitely one that I, I considered. I used him for something similar and biggest steal. Um, and, and part of that just goes back to sort of some of the, and Michael Brunson has done a great job uh, covering this. He wasn't a known name in the college football circles until after he committed to Nebraska. Yeah. Like the Huskers effectively were able to keep this guy hidden. And then player personnel guys around college football are like, wait a minute, what? This guy did what last year as a junior? And he, these are verified testing numbers. What are, what did we miss here? How did we miss this? And someone, I, I wish I had the username who said this. They had an astute observation on the board about him. Oh, it would have been in the last few days, I think. But they compared it a little bit like Hayden Moore and Nebraska's previous staff was really, really pushing for 24 seven sports to reevaluate Hayden Moore. 
Like they yep. let us know that they felt like his rating was <laughs> not on the level of where it needed to be. And lo and behold, you know who I'm, one of the most popular guys that everyone tried to poach and Michigan successfully did? Hayden Moore. And so mm-hmm. um, that it might be a similar situation where Colorado is an area that, you know, we cover, um, but it's it's a transient state. Like you have families move in and out. You don't mm-hmm. have a lot of just like roots fully developed in there. And so I, I think sometimes people get lost in the shuffle and I would definitely look for this staff, which they did it right away. Ed Foley spent time out there. Marcus Satterfield spent time out there. I would look for Colorado to be an area where, where Matt rule is going to invest some time. Uh, and they, they want to bring camp kids out here. I mean, they had a number of guys come through for visits, whether it was camps or whether it was unofficial visits in the spring. Uh, and I, I would look for Colorado to, to stay um, a spot like that. I said that Evan Cooper is my recruiter of the year, at least for this July edition of these superlatives. Do you have any argument there, Brian? No way, because this is year one. Um, I have a feeling Evan Cooper could be argued for that um, Every with, year. No, with no disrespect to anybody else. Yeah. And they would probably nod their head to that the way they respect him as an evaluator. So I think off the bat, he deserves the inaugural title, um, which I'm sure is very meaningful to him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll let him know in, in yeah. August when we see him next. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, he's just like, you can tell even like at the camps when rules out there, like Cooper's right by him and they're less like, you know, that they're, they're together. They're, too, they're two headed, you know, like it, it's uh, um, he's, he's a guy that, you know, when rule was even talking about taking this job and like, what's the talent look like there, Evan Cooper's that voice he wanted to hear from. And Evan Cooper's like offer Jalen Lloyd, take the job and offer Jalen Lloyd, you know, that sort of insight, mm-hmm. um, which tells you a lot about what they think of Jalen Lloyd too. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think he definitely deserves it because, I have a feeling, and this isn't sucking up. I really believe this. I think there's a ton of schools across the country right now that are watching who Nebraska offer. Like, I really think that it's a, maybe they're curious about how it's going to work out here and if it will play as well as it did at Baylor Mm -hmm. and they want to see it. But I think there definitely are other people across college football who have their eyes on it and are like, you know, they, they, they have a different way of doing things in Lincoln they uh and the way they track their data and all this stuff it, it's it's very particular and they have a, a very set method and it has worked maybe we should pay attention when they offer some guy who has no offers you know roger gradney is a guy 24 7 sports is big on by the way and has that as a four star but that didn't have a ton of offers when nebraska came uh knocking and um he's a guy that um you could argue is one of the best guys in this class too um and I say that because I can tell that this staff just like, yeah, we want him. We see his numbers. We see like his film and how it works with the, with the data he puts up in other sports. And yeah, let's take that guy. So um, I I think Evan Cooper is a no brainer for the, for the pick you made. Here's the last one that I will, uh, that I'll say on here. And again, check it out. Husker 24 seven summer superlatives, Nebraska's 2024 class. I struggled with this one and obviously I didn't double up with any of them and that was intentional, but even if I tried to double up, there wasn't another answer that I felt more comfortable in other than potentially Camden cook. And I stayed away from it. Who would be your instant impact guy? As you look at this 2024 class, a lot of it feels like it's at least a year or two away for, for those guys really contributing. I went with Kawan Lacey who you've talked to, And one of the reasons I did it is I think running back is one of those positions. It's easier to get on the field as a freshman than maybe some others. We've seen it in recent years. It's also one of those positions where a couple injuries happen and suddenly all that depth that you're all proud of is gone. And so I, I guess I wouldn't be shocked if he walks into a situation whenever he arrives on campus and, you know, EJ Barthel basically says, all right, you're up get in the drill. Let's go. Let's see what you can do. And they see somebody that can help them out, whether it's as a pass catcher out of the backfield, running the ball in special teams as a gunner or other things. This staff has certainly talked with more guys about what their potential special teams roles 
could be than what I've noticed in the past. And I just, there was the best answer I had. Is there somebody I missed here? No. Um, and you picked a good one. Um, I might say a receiver just because I, I thought I, about Isaiah McMorris. That's who I was going to say. I like McMorris a lot. He's one of my favorite guys in the class. I, I think he's, uh, he's really sharp. Like he's a really sharp guy when you talk to him. And I think he's just from the interviews we've done about his sort of trips to visit with Garrett McGuire. I feel like there might be a chemistry there that allows him um, to pick things up pretty fast at a position where I do think you can get on the field quicker than others to the point though, of your question. And I think this is the point it makes. This is a class where, um, it's there aren't those obvious like four or five guys like who are first year players. It, it, there there is development that needs to take place, and ideally, um, you know, some of the guys they have now from this last class, they can kind of get them moving along where a few of those guys contribute. So there's not as much pressure right away for all these guys to find the field. Now we could get into a whole conversation about red shirts and stuff, which I think is pretty interesting about how much value is really in a red shirt anymore. Um, when, when kids leave after two or three years or want to like, mm-hmm. even, even the other day when, uh, Preston to, to, to Mua, um, was talking about, uh, committing Nebraska, he said, I'm going to spend the next three to four years at Nebraska. And that that's, I've noticed a lot of kids say that now instead of like four to five or whatever. And so the point is it's very, it's shortened down now. Um, sometimes, uh, how long people are at a college. And so I do think you like to get guys on the field and keep them active as much as possible, but it's not as easy right now to say who for sure those guys are. You know, the other thing about the instant impact conversation, and I'm just thinking of this now, if I would have tried to write this same thing in February, I probably did. You know whose names I probably didn't put down? Prince, Prince Will, Uman Ellen, and Cameron Lenhart. Yeah. Yeah. And look at those two. I mean, like, so... For as much as we think we know, we know, and we admittedly at least will tell you with a straight face, we don't know that much and we believe it. But for whatever little kernels we think we know, sometimes you just go over there and a dude is a dude and he shows up and plays like a dude. And that's sort of what happened with those guys. Mm -hmm. And the conventional wisdom of, oh, they're going to need a year or two in the weight room to kind of get physically where they need to be. No, you got quick twitch. You're explosive. You can put some weight on right away. You're going out there. And this is a staff more willing to do that. And so now that I'm rethinking this, I kind of have to throw all the conventional wisdom of, yeah, he's going to need a year or two to get it. No, that that might just be gone. Like if you can play and you can help, they're probably going to play you. And again, I mean, how often is it a guy like Malcolm Hartzog that you overlook because of physical limitations ends up being the dude that shows up and and is better than guys that are physically bigger or thought to be more ready to play. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're this, this seems to happen a lot. And so all of this to say the instant impact is probably a category I will be striking from the record moving forward because (laughs) I just don't think I'm going to do a good job with it. I think it's hard. Yeah. Sometimes it's also to get your, to, to say out loud, um, well, I, this kid's going to beat out these guys. You, you're so used to certain guys in the program who you've yeah. talked about for three to four years, and you're, you're, it's kind of like it's their turn, right? You know, And I do think um, coaching staffs that are bold and believe in their evals and recruits don't look at it that way. It's not like, oh, this guy, he, he's behind this guy in line. Be, you know, it, And I'm not in the other staff was like that, but I think even more so with this coaching staff, Um, I'd be on edge if I were a veteran guy, um, because these are, these are recruits that, you know, are handpicked by these coaches and they believe in for various reasons. And they have shown in the past, they are not afraid to play young guys and let them grow through the fire. So, um, Mario Buford's a guy you could throw out there just knowing the Buford family and like how quick Marquise was about picking Mm -hmm. things up. And even though he got injured his first spring, he still was on the field a lot as a first year player and has played ever since Um, you kind of think that could be in the genes and Mario Buford's got big time skills. So he would be a guy that you might say could jump in there quick too. All right. Anything else you want to, uh, to throw out there, Brian? I got nothing else to throw out there except 
I, I I'll say it out loud. This will put the pressure on us to deliver it. All right, uh, let's do it. Tease, tease the folks. Yeah, let them know yeah. what they're going to hear later this week. So, so la- last podcast we did, um, we kind of randomly walked into the idea of like, hey, what about going back and doing just a podcast about Nebraska games that have gone to overtime? And uh, it, the, it started with you talking about Nebraska's been incredibly inept on offense, uh, like actually not moving the ball forward a yard um like the last four overtimes or whatever it's been and so but there were some good times there are wins at notre dame they beat iowa state when Corey ross caught one i don't want to give it all away but we can go through these and i think have a good time for uh 25 minutes to two hours we'll see how long it it takes us to get through it but uh, that should be our next podcast and it will be all right, the overtime extravaganza coming up later this week with Husker 24-7. For Brian Christopherson, I'm Mike Shaver. You can check out everything that we do at Husker247.com, where we provide daily coverage of your favorite team, the Nebraska Cornhuskers. We'll have another podcast later this week, so be looking for that. Be sure to check out everything else at Husker 24-7. We'll catch you next time.